Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Reality Is. It's always, it's newer, but today is the very first episode of a new weekly series that we are adding to the podcast uh, because it's a big hit on the Patreon. It's where I talk to my brother, Raheel, about what's going on in real life. I had some like ideas about the name of this segment, but it was like, the reality is real life. What's really reality? I don't know. And all of I'm it a... makes me laugh because Raheel kind of sounds like real. And yes. here we are. We can make a pun off of it. Hello, how the are Raheel you? Life. The Raheel life. I hate it. The, Ra- the Raheeliality is. Oh, that doesn't work. It's no, it doesn't. Full. Now you're too far away from your mic. I was told to mind my manners. No, I didn't tell you to mind your manners. I just said, learn to use a microphone. Guys, this is going off without a hitch. (laughs) It's too much pressure. (laughs) Whatever. Anyway, welcome. Welcome now. Officially, you a person, a regular on the podcast. I regret it already. Oh, no. (laughs) I'm going to get canceled. I mean... You know what? There's no faster way for me to get canceled than to be like, let me bring my misogynist brother on the podcast. Am I a misogynist? I'm not a misogynist. I'm a good guy. I'm an ally. I'm a friend of the people. Mm. Listen, I think we're all a little bit misogynist because of the society that we live in. (laughs) (laughs) One of my friends sent me like this uh, in one of our groups. He sent uh-huh. some picture about, like, I don't know, I was putting down alpha males. Like, if somebody describes themselves as alpha male, I think uh-huh. of it in, like, a computer term because there's, I don't know, it's, like, riddled with errors or whatever. Okay. And I was like, hey, guys, what a nerdy you guys think fucking I'm an joke. alpha male? Wait, what a nerdy joke, by the yeah, way. I know. So I was like, hey, guys, do you guys think I'm an alpha male? And they're like, that is not a question an alpha male would ask. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you're an alpha male. No. You think I'm an alpha woman? I think you're barely a woman. Okay, this means. is not going well. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think you are... Uh, I don't know how to answer that. What does that mean? <laughs> what is an alpha woman? I don't know. An alpha female. Yeah, like, do do I have uh, alpha energy, you think? Well, you have... You. <laughs> I have to be so careful. What I, have to say. <laughs> I think that answers the question. <laughs> 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 oh boy, we were, we were real close there. Really um, close. Yeah. All right. So every week we're going to use a Monday episode to talk about just things that are going on, pop culture things, sports things, news things, real life things. And uh, today I have a list of things I want to talk about. Do you want to start with sports? No, we can save the sports for later. Why not? Want, it's, up, it's up to you. I mean, there's a lot of sports going on. The The Yankees game is going on right now. They're, okay, tell me about the Yankees. So they are in the ALDS, which oh, is the God. American League. Oh, that sounds series. like the Church of L- L- Latter-day Saints. I'll bring it around for you. They're playing the Guardians. Do you know who the Guardians are? Of the Galaxy. No, they're the team from Cleveland. You may have known them uh, with a different name. The Indians. Yes. They changed oh. their name. Good. That's yeah. good. Good for you. Good for yeah. you. Good for you, Cleveland. <laughs> so that's happening. Um, that was a good football day today. The 49ers lost, which is sad for me. Handsome Jimmy didn't come through for you. Handsome Jimmy is uh, bewildering. I don't understand him. Tell me, what he's, does that mean? He's very good, and then he's very bad. 
He makes all these great plays, and then you're just like, oh, Jimmy, don't fuck this up. And then he fucks it up. <laughs> and then you see him on the sideline, and he takes his helmet off, and then he brushes his hair, and you're like, ah. That's how I feel about Candace from Rehearsals of Potomac. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because she's so good, and then sometimes she'll say something, and I'm like, ah, oh, Candace, that's so mean. You're body shaming yeah. someone. And then she twirls and flips her hair, and I'm like, oh, God, you're so pretty, though. Ooh, I got a question for you. This is sports-related. Sure. Oh, God. So do you know about – well, this is – I mean, it's about sports, but I think it will also interest you. Okay. And uh, and maybe the listeners. Um, so you know about all of, like, the like the head injuries that happen in the NFL, right? Sure. So there's um, been a lot of emphasis put on protecting the quarterbacks because of what happened to a Tagliavola. Do you know who mm-hmm. that is? Yes. Okay. So last Thursday, um, so they've been calling a lot of roughing the passer calls. And mm-hmm. it's almost too much. It's like you can barely touch the quarterback now and then people get upset. Anyways, okay. uh, last Monday, actually, uh, Troy mm-hmm. Aikman was announcing a game. And somebody got a roughing the passer call and he was like upset about it because it was just a regular tackle. It shouldn't have been like a roughing the passer. It shouldn't have been a, it shouldn't have been a penalty. Mm-hmm. And he said, it's time for them to take their dresses off and let them play. Now, oh. are you offended by that comment? Yes. <laughs> that's, that's a misogynist comment. Yeah. He apologized for it. Mm-hmm. Okay. If you're saying that shit on camera, Troy, what are you saying off camera? Okay, that's what I want to know. Well, I think we should only judge him for what he says on camera. You can't judge him for what he says off camera. Yeah, but I judge. Just if I, listen, listen. People are putting on their best faces on camera, and if their on camera face is a piece of shit, then our off camera face is an even bigger piece of shit. It it's was a the really whole bad shit. Call, it's not even a piece of shit. What? It was a really bad call. Oh, I can see real? what you're <laughs> That's not okay. That's not okay. I asked you a question over text, and I think I, it's time I bring it up because we've spent enough time talking about football where I feel like this is a normal segue. You've mm-hmm. talked on the Patreon a lot about how much you love Touchdown Tommy, a.k.a. Thomas Brady. Is his name? Is yeah. his first name William? I don't know. Why? Isn't Tom Brady's first name something else? Not, I, not that I know of. Maybe. Is Are you thinking of Thomas Cruz, maybe? William Mapather Cruz? <laughs> I was. You're right. Yeah, of I course. I got my Toms mixed up. You got your touchdown Tommy's mixed up. You got your Tommy's mixed up. It's Top Gun Tommy to- and Touchdown got- Tommy. <laughs> yeah, there's Top Gun Tommy and then there's Touchdown Tommy. Touchdown Tommy is yeah. Tom Brady. Yes. Now, you love Tom Brady. I love him. Again, I want to clarify. I love him for his accomplishments. I think it's very impressive what he has done. By the way, the I saw him again today years. in an article. Somebody posted an article or something on Twitter. I didn't even click on it. It was something about something. I don't know. I Did the Buccaneers lose? Uh, I believe the Buccaneers lost today. Yeah. yeah. And he was very okay. upset. He was yelling at his offensive line. Yeah. And honestly, I feel like every week he just looks worse. He looks He's... like he hasn't slept. He's 45, man. He's 45. What do you want from him? No, he's, he's in good shape. He's aged rapidly recently. Well, he's like going just, through a lot. Obviously, between the divorce. <laughs> yes. And all of that. Oh, yes. God. Um, yeah, anyway, he looks like shit, or he'll, He looks really bad. He looks like he yeah. hasn't slept in days. He... He just... He looks really bad. I feel like maybe... Maybe we should bring the nightshades back. Well, again, I, I don't. I just want to clarify that my appreciation for touchdown Tommy is about the touchdowns. It's not about the face. The face is very nice. The face you wouldn't kick that that face out of bed. No, he looks psychotic. I'm not into white men like that. Did you not know that about me? <laughs> You're not into any white men. No, I'm not into like that looking white man. What does that mean? Like I'm not, I'm not into like a uh, fratty looking white guy. Yeah, like that's not my look. Yeah, yeah, Honestly, yeah. that's why like Chris Hemsworth and Chris Pratt don't do it for me. Chris They're too Chris. jockey. I don't like that. I like a, I, I like a nice jock. By the I way, like I a, mean, you know, I like a, if if I am gonna like a white man, it's likely he's gonna have uh, brown hair. Um, I love a brunette. Mm-hmm. 
and um, and maybe like an olive undertone. Well, we talked about this on the Patreon, but I thought that Brad Pitt in Meet Joe Black is the best a white man has ever looked. <laughs> Brad Pitt in that suit is the best. It's like the best. It's like the, the the ceiling of whiteness to me because you have to be wearing a suit also, right? Like you have to have that look, like that that business because that's where white men kind of apparently that's where they excel. Mm-hmm. That business setting is All Brad right, you, Pitt a natural blonde? I have no idea. I think so. I feel like he's not. I feel like we spent a lot of time, a lot of time with Brad Pitt with like highlights because that was a thing that we were doing in the 90s. We mm-hmm. as in just people, not me. I never got highlights in the 90s because I was 10. But I don't think Brad Pitt is a natural blonde. I think even in Meet Joe Black, those beautiful. Oh, those are definitely highlights. Oh, those, yeah. are, <laughs> those are highlights. Those are definitely. Death got highlights. Um. Anyway, is Doug Pitt blonde? Uh, Doug Pitt was not blonde. Oh, if you don't know, and because you're this is the first time you're hearing of this, uh, we did an episode on the Patreon which covered Meet Joe Black, where he was one of his favorite movies, in which he did tell everybody that Doug Pitt is a personal friend of his, and that's close Brad Pitt's personal brother. friend. Yeah, <laughs> we spent three glorious days together, <laughs> and he and then he sent you an email once. He sent me an email once from a beach in Mexico. <laughs> Where were you when you read the email? On the toilet? I, <laughs> um, I, I like I probably wasn't too far away from the toilet. Okay. Yes. But, so uh, your room. I was in New Jersey. Yeah. Yeah. Um, back to football stuff. I had a question for you. Yes. Um, if you could kiss Touchdown Tommy or Jimmy, Handsome Jimmy from the 49ers, who would mm-hmm. you rather kiss? On the mouth? Where am I kissing him? On the cheek? Yeah, on the dick. On the mouth. <laughs> now, you got to set the scenario for me. Like, okay, am I just here's going a, okay, up? fine, fine. Here, here, okay. Here's here's the deal. It's a magical kiss. Okay, it's a magical kiss. And if you kiss them, you get some of their uh, athleticism, but you don't get to pick which ones of their flaws you also get. What is this? No. <laughs> what do you mean it's a magical kiss? Why do I have to kiss them? Why can't I just hire their trainers? I think that seems like an easier. Because there's a handsome involved, a handsomeness so, involved here. So I think um, I, I would. Because I re- you know why, Real? Wait, you know why? Because you just told me that handsome Jimmy plays so pa- badly sometimes, but then he takes off his helmet and he shakes his hair and you forgive him. <laughs> yeah, but, but part of that is also the history. Right. I've been watching Handsome Jimmy play for my team for the last five years. And it's really trick or treat. Like sometimes when he's playing really poorly and you're like, oh, fuck Jimmy. I just I'm done with Jimmy. (laughs) And then he pulls these plays out of his ass and then they beat. They always tend to beat teams that are way better than them. Mm -hmm. Um, But then they lose to teams like they lost to the Falcons today and they should not have lost to the Falcons today. Right. So that's the reason. I mean, if I had to pick one to kiss, I'd kiss Jimmy only because he plays for my team. Okay, that's great. Yeah. All the players on your team get a kiss from you. Mm, well, Debo Samuel, I would, uh, I want to protect him like he's my child. I love him <laughs> so much. He's so I good. have to Google this man. What's his name? Well, he's Debo Samuel. His actual name isn't Debo, but they started calling him Debo after the character uh, in Friday. Mm-hmm. Have you seen Friday? Yeah. He's very good. He catches oh my the God, ball. He's so cute. <gasps> he's and then, handsome. And then he and then he takes all of like uh, all these tacklers try to bring him down and he just breaks through them and he just keeps running and he's the best. Takes mm-hmm. all these short passes. There's a guy named Brandon Ayuk who I've been rooting for for the last um I don't know for the last three years, but he doesn't seem to break out. He's a wide receiver. I think mm-hmm. the most, I think the actually the the most handsome guy on the team, if I had to pick one, is a gentleman named Fred Warner. Oh, you'd love Fred Warner. Look up Fred Warner. Okay, we're looking. Oh, what a smile on Fred! Oh yeah, and he's so good. Mm. He is great. Oh, like he's Kyle, Kyle, Kyle Yushek is a nice guy. If you're like into a Harvard guy, he's a Harvard guy. <laughs> So that's nice. 
Um, I love these well-rounded players that you're presenting me. You know what? It seems like you care because I'm your sister and you're like, I know that you would probably want somebody who's a little bit more well-rounded, like a Harvard yeah, guy. Exactly. I appreciate that. Um, and then there is a, a big offensive lineman who's probably like the MVP because he's injured right now and the team is shit named mm-hmm. uh, Trent Williams. He's like 360 mm-hmm. pounds, but I love him. He's great. Okay. Great. Um, you know Eagles who you are... should not kiss? I, I yeah. actually have somebody who you should stay away from. Mm, yeah. Who? Even though he's a great player. What's his name? Uh, his name is Nick Bosa. Okay. Uh, oh, Nick Bosa. God. He, no, I would never kiss this man. Look at him. I would never kiss this man. Also, um, him and his dad, very big Trumpers. No, so. look at him. He looks like he looks like a MAGA hat walking around. <laughs> Yeah, like this is exactly the problem, right? Like this is the exact man that I would never want to kiss, even though he is a white man with brown hair, but he just has an air about him. Jockey guys just like, I have so much PTSD from being screamed at by Mm -hmm. jocks in high school, uh, being called terrorist and such. And I'm like, I would never be into this. It kills my lady boner. 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 Uh, Right away. Um. Okay, and you know, Raheel, because I didn't give you time to talk about this last week on the Patreon because I rushed you, we were talking about other important stuff. You should go and listen to the Patreon. Uh, We talked a lot about Lizzo and body dysmorphia and representation of people in media, et cetera, et cetera. We were talking about important stuff, so it was important to give that time, but I did rush you, and we didn't get to talk about Aaron Judge, who did what? He hit 62 home runs. <laughs> Would you like to talk about the significance of the 62 home runs? It we touched a, on it already. Yeah, it's a uh, home run uh, record uh, since whom? <laughs> so it's what they're what they're calling it is the clean home run record. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because all the ones so, in between um, were just painted, doped up. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So Barry Bonds, Sammy Sosa, and Mark McGuire. They were tainted. You know, I, was... I, was, I still root for Barry Bonds. Even yeah. though he's a dick. He's awful. Terrible human being. Terrible person. Um, it, How did it make you feel when Aaron Judge uh, did that? <laughs> when he hit the 62nd home run. Uh-huh. And I, and I saw him rounding the bases mm-hmm. and pointing to his mom. Yeah. And then she was hugging his dad. Mm-hmm. And then he, they just mentioned that he was adopted as a child uh-huh. and he's biracial and he's like the best guy in the world. And then uh-huh. the team came out and mobbed him and then uh-huh. they stopped the game. Yep. And how did I feel about it? I cried. Yeah. That's what I did. <laughs> how do you think I felt about it? <laughs> oh, there was one sad sweet. part about it, which was because like I watched it on TV. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I also wanted to get like the reaction of the announcers on mm-hmm. radio because I love the, the radio announcers. Mm-hmm. Um, so John Sterling was there, but Susan Waldman, who again, I think you need to have Susan Waldman in your life. Um, <laughs> she, she did not make the trip to Texas. Okay. Because she was sick. Okay. I hope she's okay. Is she all right? Well, she's like 76 years old. Oh my gosh. Protect but, Susan Waldman. Yeah. But in the Derek Jeter documentary, the captain, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Susan Waldman was prominently featured, and she was wearing leather pants. So oh, okay. I don't know what that means, but that's good. <laughs> she looked great. Okay. So what about it? What about what? We got distracted. <laughs> Susan, well, you said you were going to the radio to listen yeah, to Yeah, I went thing. to the radio to listen to Susan Waldman, but she wasn't there. Oh, that's okay. That's yeah, the story. I'm, I'm got sure. it. Hey, <laughs> real quick about, because um, you have been asking me to watch The Captain. Mm-hmm. Which I said I wouldn't, but the only thing I want to tell you about Derek Jeter, because I know that you love him, is that um, recently I've been listening to, so, you know, Mariah Carey is a favorite of mine from growing up, and still, I'm a big time Mariah Carey fan. She released a 25th anniversary of her album, Honey. No, Mm -hmm. Honey, no, of Butterfly. Okay. And uh, it's amazing. It's very good. And it has all these like little tidbits about all the songs and stuff, right? Yeah. And um, did you know that the song My All is about Derek Jeter? Oh, look at that. Way to go, Jeets. <laughs> Way to go, Jeets. 
Oh, Captain, my Captain. He got that yeah. song for yeah. Mariah. So that's very exciting. I do think that Mariah Carey and Derek Jeter would have made a handsome couple, like a forever couple. Nah, I don't think so. What? You hate too, her. That's they're... why. No, it's not just that. I think they're just too big. Both of them are just too big personalities. I don't think that works. Do, yeah, have, right. do, you, do you not remember the Mariah Carey Cribs? Of course I remember it. <laughs> there's no there's no place for the captain in that house. You're right. Oh my god, I saw a TikTok recently that really bothered me. First mm-hmm. of all, can I just say there's a lot of bad takes on TikTok. And this makes me sound like such an old person, but I am. But there's just like a lot of young people discovering very basic things from like 2001. Mm-hmm. And just like speaking about it about it so would like it's so with such hyperbole that I'm like somebody take away this idiot's phone. But I came across this video of like 1990s pop divas, right? Mm-hmm. Real, you want to know who was in that? Who? Okay. First of all, everything was from 99. Oh. So it was like Britney Spears, Jessica Simpson, Mandy Moore, Christina Aguilera, and then Mariah Carey. And I was like, this is not the 90s divas. That list doesn't make any sense. It doesn't First make all, any sense. Jessica Simpson was just a throw-in. Yeah. Jessica Simpson had like one good song. And it was, and, you know, I sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. No, so and that one song I figured out after the fact, it was only good because it used like the the guitar riff from Jack and Diane. The John Cooper oh, Mellencamp. Yeah, song. yeah, yeah. hmm That's the only reason why it was good. Um, Mm -hmm. there was, uh, and then I think she redid the Top Gun song, which obviously I felt a certain way about. Um, but other than that, she really wasn't like a big, I don't remember any Jessica Simpson songs. Yeah. Well, her very first song was I Want to Love You Forever. And recently I, uh, just like the other night, my friends were over and we were talking about pop songs from the nineties that we loved. We talked, we were listening to Aqua, um, (laughs) for no reason at all. Do you remember Which Dr. One Jones? Is, is it? Is it? Oh, Barbie Dr. Girl. Jones. Barbie Girl. Yeah. yeah. You know Dr. Album. Jones. That was a good By album. Aqua. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Dr. Anyway. Jones. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> so anyway, we we're talking about songs in the 90s and Jessica Simpson's song, I Want to Love You Forever. The lyrics are eh, <laughs> real. It's wild. It's so the song was supposed to be a gospel song, right? Mm-hmm. And and the lyrics of it is a little bit troubling. Um, I'm going to just pull up the one part of it. It's <laughs> the lyrics are pour yourself all over me and I'll cherish every drop here on my knees. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, wait, I'll cherish every drop what? Here on my knees. No, no, Jessica. Why? <laughs> and this is like virginal Jessica Simpson, whose dad is writing her songs for her. And this is supposed to be a gospel song. Anyway, I digress. The point is, this person made a video saying the 1990s pop divas included Mandy Moore. I, I, the, just a list. Okay. Making a list of divas from the 90s and putting Mandy Moore and Jessica Simpson on it with Mariah Carey is it, it's bananas. It's ridiculous. I, I I mean, I guess so you they're saying pop divas, right? Yeah, but a person born in like 2000 fucking 4 probably made this goddamn video. Yeah, that person's an idiot. But yeah. now I my the their hamster wheel in my head is turning. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking of the pop divas from the 90s. Yep. Uh, and uh, I'm making a list. Yep. So Whitney, obviously. Yeah. Yep. Mariah. Mm-hmm. Celine, for you and yep. I. Yep. I'm throwing Shania in there. We're going VH1 Divas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, yeah. that first that first uh, uh, VH1 Divas also had Aretha Franklin in it, which I really don't have a relationship with Aretha Franklin. But she's like the first you, diva. Yeah. But I am also throwing in uh, Tony Braxton. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Tony, Bra- Tony Braxton Bra- was huge. Um, another diva I want to go ahead and put in there, by the way, is um, in the original one was Gloria Estefan. Oh, 
There's like four Gloria Stefan songs that are incredible. Is one of them the one with sync? Did they sing in Spanish in that? <laughs> they sure did. Have, have they you sure ever did. heard? Um, have you ever heard the Spanish version of uh, "This I Promise You"? I'm sure you have. <laughs> no. They they performed it at the Latin Grammys, I think, in like 1999 or 2000. Are it's any of really them good. even? Are any of them even a little bit Hispanic? Um, I what's Joey? Joey Fatone. No, he's Italian, right? He's Italian as fuck. He's Italian he's, as meatball subs. Okay, he's well, super he's, Italian. He, he's Italian, but he also played uh, a Greek. He did. <laughs> he did in the Greek. JC Chazé. He's got to be um, a little bit Spanish, right? Wait, that <laughs> okay. sounds so racist. <laughs> That's so racist. Backtrack that. Fix that for me, will you? <laughs> Uh, he would, uh, I would assume that J.C. Chazé has some Latin roots based mm-hmm. on his last name. Let's see. What does the internet say? He is white. Well, uh, or I don't know. He was adopted by a white couple. Um, but, oh, my God, he's a foster kid. Wait, I'm sh- Oh, my God. J.C. I feel like we need to talk more about J.C. Chazé, but he was raised a Mennonite. Oh, really? I don't yeah. know what that is. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's one of those, like, you know, Christian sects yeah. or whatever. But anyway, Chazé, I feel like if that was his adopted last name, we have no idea. Maybe Chris Kirkpat. Nope, Kirkpatrick. No, Kirkpatrick. <laughs> it seems like a, like a douchebag from Pittsburgh. <laughs> I think he might be. Um, you know, the thing about J.C. Chazé is that he was kicked out of the limelight prematurely for Justin yeah. Timberlake. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. He's a better because, singer. Yeah, and because the Backstreet Boys also had Nick Carter, mm-hmm. but they knew that their bread and butter was Brian, who, by yeah. the way, can get fucked down. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. But uh, I always thought that J.C. got uh, he got a raw deal. Yeah, he did. He, you know, Justin Timberlake, I have so many thoughts about, is, you know, I, we were talking about, when we were talking about um, House of the Dragon last week, and you were talking mm-hmm. about, like, the nosedive that Chris, uh, Sir Kristen Cole took. Yeah. <laughs> That's the nosedive that Justin Timberlake has taken for me in my life. And what it's such a shame. J- what was the JT peak for you? JT peak for me was his, uh, was my love. The song "My Love," oh, okay. with Ti, yeah, the and second, so future the sex second love album. sounds, yeah. That whole album was the JT peak, you know. And I'll even say "Mirror," "Mirrors." No, I listened to that song probably a million times, and then after that, I was like, "Oh, the rest of this music is garbage." And then the next thing I knew, he's an anti-vaxer. So I was like, "All right, he can get fucked." Yeah. I think for me, uh, the JT uh, peak is probably around the same time that you, mm-hmm. uh, which I think is around 2009, right? Yep. The 2009 Future Sex Love Sounds. My favorite song on it is uh, the one that's really long, uh, yep. but then it changes in the middle. The interlude. The interlude, yeah. That one. It's that song best. is his best song, yes. It's so the he greatest. had that out. I would, I would listen to the Love Stoned, I Think That She Knows interlude on repeat. Yes forever if i could it's it's so pretty it's beautiful anyways so that was great and then he was great on saturday night live for like the Mm -hmm. first three times right yeah so my peak for jt is the 2009 espies he hosted the 2009 espies and he Mm -hmm. was fantastic Mm -hmm. he was hilarious he was singing it was just a great time right um and then he came he was in the social network and i always thought that he messed up the social network for me I've like never watched that, that movie. movie. Really? Yeah. They say it's the movie of the 2000s, which I guess okay. makes sense. Because it's about Facebook. But it came out in 2010. 2010, 2009. Uh, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Okay. But it is. I mean, that's basically what the 2000s have been about. So it's very good. Okay. But anyway, he was bad in it. He was bad in it. And that's when he started dipping. And then it was like, oh, I have to deal with. Justin Timberlake, the actor now? No, no, thank you. I'm not interested in this. And then he was in a piece of shit movie called In Time. Have you watched In Mm -hmm. Time? 
I've not watched it, but I do remember that was a thing. Yeah, that was that was terrible. And then I was just like, oh, okay, I don't want to deal with Justin Timberlake anymore. And that was it. That's great. And then now I feel like he's just on as like Jimmy Fallon's sidekick. You know, honestly, Jimmy Fallon's friendship with Justin Timberlake has made me dislike Jimmy Fallon. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I dislike Jimmy Fallon, I want to say around 26. Well, that's when he had Donald Trump on, right? Uh, That was the last straw. I was like, yeah, that was it. That was it. Um, Also, um, on the topic of Justin Timberlake versus JC, I feel like a lot of Justin Timberlake's like rise was because he dated Britney Spears and was able to sort of like continue to stay. He got a level of importance and relevance within NSYNC because of his relationship with Britney Spears, I think. I think it helped, but I think they were, they were like, they, they wanted to make him the, like the main guy in NSYNC anyways, because he was the youngest and I think he was popular before that too. So. No, but I feel like that really carried him over because like musically and all the songs, it was definitely JC that like carried yeah. the band. No, I think yeah, no, I definitely agree. Like, so they made it made him a much bigger celebrity because he was part of this pop, you know, couple. Super yeah, couple. exactly. With their denim magic denim outfits. Yeah. <sighs> anyway, all right, let's move on to a new topic, uh, and I don't know how to segue from it, but I do want to talk about this um, this lady because. I think she and I have the same name. The racist L.A. councilwoman who has now resigned. Is her name Nuri Martinez? I have no idea. Her name, her her first name is Nuri? That's right. Nuri? It's N-U-R-Y. That sounds like Nuri. Yeah. What a shame. Anyway, (laughs) this racist lady, no longer for now form a former councilwoman last week. Uh, was caught on tape. She is a Latina woman, and she was recorded on tape. Somebody released it saying all kinds of racist stuff about black people, Mm -hmm. (laughs) using uh, slurs in Spanish, saying all kinds of terrible things. This person then apologized um, and uh, resigned. When this kind of stuff happens, right, like when somebody does like a racist thing and then is um, is like caught and then resigns, do you feel like that's enough? I mean, I don't know what more you would want to do to the person, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I don't know what more you can do to the person. Yeah. Um, I, I definitely think, you know, if it's, if it's somebody who has – um, a position, a public position like she did, of course she should resign. And if she doesn't resign, then she should be forced out, I think. Um, at the same time, I think, uh, you know, that's what I would like to see happen. Um, but at the same time, it's like, I don't know where freedom of speech stuff kind of, uh, where that, where the line for that is, is right. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that she's definitely somebody who is not, um, up to the standard of holding office. Yeah. Um, but uh, I don't know. What do you think? Well, I was I was thinking about this because I was talking to my friends the other day about uh, the Brett Favre stuff, right? And like how mm-hmm. he's being investigated by the feds. And like every week there's like war shit coming out about Brett Favre and all the shit that he did with stealing money and all the bullshit that he's done. And I sometimes wonder... Like I, I'm so. I think that there's such a desire for like hard justice, right? Like of like we need justice against people who are like racist and terrible, and we need to uphold them. But I sometimes worry that when we want more and more and more like retaliation against somebody who has done bad, that sometimes the opposite side of things, like the right wing, for example, will then prop that person up because they'll be like, "Oh, look at the woke mob." coming against this person right like even this woman this councilwoman i think she's a democrat right yeah yeah so like she's been she's resigned whatever the best thing for her would be to like fade into obscurity and do something else with her life right like move on do something else figure your shit out lady figure out like 
maybe you should work on addressing racism within your community, within yourself, within your family, whatever. Um, but if I feel like if we ask for more, it gives an opportunity for the right wing, for like the Candace Owens of the world or like the Joe yeah. Rogans of the world to then take this person and be like, isn't it crazy that people aren't giving you a chance? Isn't it crazy like what they did to your life? Like, you yeah. know, the the they're the right wing or like the, they love to say like, oh, the left are the party of tolerance or whatever, but they're not. They're so intolerant. They're so hateful and all that stuff. And so like I wonder sometimes like at what point do we – is it – I wonder sometimes is it something that we can even control or – do we just have to be like, yes, it's possible that this person will be picked up by the right wing media or the right wing, like right wingers or conservatives and then propped up? Mm -hmm. um, or should we should we just say this is right and this is wrong? And for us to say that this is wrong is it is enough. Like, I don't know. I worry so, sometimes. But it's like, am I worrying the, for nothing? What's wrong is wrong and what's right is right. And that's all I should think about. So it depends, right? I think what we forget is that um, you know, we're kind of in a transitionary period in terms of culture, you know what I mean? And it's, and it's tough to, um, like sometimes, you know, obviously when you hear what she says, right, you're like, fuck, this is wrong. This yep. is just wrong. And that's it wrong. She should lose her job. That's it. Right. Um, but then, you know, you think about it like that, that recording that came out, right. Mm -hmm. She is talking to other people. Yep. The other people are kind of giggling al along. They're laughing. They're laughing yep. Along. Now, do those people lose their jobs also? Mm -hmm. right? Are those people just as racist? And, you know, even if it's somebody that's not like holding office or anything like that, right? Like we have, this is, a, a, she's a Latina, right? Mm-hmm. In our experience as Pakistanis and, you know, having Pakistani friends and Indian friends and stuff like that, right? There are conversations that you, I'm sure you and I have walked into many, many times that are just, you know, no doubt about a racist. Yep. Right? So it's like, what do you do in that situation? Well, you know what I do. Well, yeah, I do know. I do know everybody knows. Mean. Everybody knows what I do, and which is why I don't have a lot of friends. <laughs> so that's the thing right so like i'm in all these like whatsapp groups and stuff like that and it's you know sometimes i i have to be like okay i have to pick and choose my battles mm -hmm. right um in some of my groups um you know it's gotten to the point where i've picked enough battles where they know that hey if it's something that's kind of borderline or whatever um uh, we probably shouldn't send it in this group because real is going to be an asshole and it's going to be awkward for everybody which is great which is exactly yeah which is great I that's what you want yep yeah. But then, you know, you also get like, you know, these groups like th this basketball group that I'm a part of with your husband or whatever. Mm -hmm. People will send videos from like world star hip hop or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you know exactly what it is that they are. Sometimes they say it. And if they say it, then we correct them on it. But a lot of times you also know what they're trying to, you know, the message that they're trying to convey or whatever. Right? Yeah. Um. And then you try, you know, again, it's the same thing. It's like you pick and choose your battles. Like, I don't know, like the, a lot of times the people that send it, I consider them to be my friends or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's like, well, how can I be friends with this person? But then you're also like, well, you know, I've, it's weird because when you see stuff like that, you're like, well, this person is just, you know, their racism to me, I'm actually understanding it as a lack of humanity because how can you, how can you, you know, put another race of people down like that? How can you be okay with that? But yeah. At the same time, I've benefited from their humanity in the past, which is the reason why I'm their friend, right? Yeah. So it's like, you just kind of pick and choose your battles. This, this is different because obviously she's a person that's holding office. I just don't think that she's worthy of office. But then yeah. it's also like, well, do you force them to quit? Or do you let, um, you know, do you let like your vote decide? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if yeah. if if she didn't want to quit and she ran for office again, right? Wouldn't shouldn't wouldn't the right thing be that she just gets voted out? Yes. The so the right thing to do, the right thing to do would be to not run. 
Um, because I think that if we, I mean, we all know that like politicians are not the most humble people, right? So much mm -hmm. of being a politician or being famous or like being, a, I don't know, like a celebrity, it it is this like you have this extreme like confidence in yourself and you feel like you are worthy or you've been or at least at least you you've had to exist in a world for so long where you've had to talk so positively about yourself that you mm -hmm. start to believe that there's nothing wrong with you so i do yeah. think that there is that right like no politician really thinks that anything that they do is wrong etc cetera, etc cetera. and people i believe that people have good intentions but in this situation with this woman the best thing for her to do especially as a democrat who knows she knows that the shit that she was saying was fucked up like mm -hmm. she knows that that's not the shit that you're supposed to say. Like she knows that that's racist stuff that she said, right? Yeah. She's fully aware of it because she is a Democrat and she knows exactly the shit that the party stands for. She knows that it is racist. She was racist anyway because she thought I can be racist around my friends. Yeah. And the fucked up thing is that if she runs again, what she's essentially saying in my eyes is – you know, I think I should be given a chance because I made a simple mistake of trusting people around me or, you know, or like people should give me a chance because it was like a simple mistake or whatever. Like, yeah. I just feel like the best thing to do in those situations is to take a step back and say, maybe I am not somebody that should be an elected official sitting in a seat and I should just like politely step back and then allow somebody else to take the position, at least from my party. Like that would be the sensible thing to do. But it's so hard because in politics, they're so convinced that they're like they're like the best person for the job. Like so much of mm -hmm. their mentality is that way. That I'm like yeah. not sure how anybody would navigate it. But I think you said something interesting, which is like about how can like their racism comes from a place of not having humanity, but you have benefited from other people's humanity. I think it's so hard because it's like we could say that about our family right? Like, yeah. like there are times when I have heard homophobic, transphobic, racist shit in our family. That person is still our family member. We cannot make them not our family. But I think the most I find I can do in those situations is tell them that it's fucked up. Like making your friends and family uncomfortable because they're being racist, I think is always on the table. Like if, yeah. if somebody is racist around me, I'm uncomfortable around them and I'm going to tell them that they make me uncomfortable. I'm going to tell them that it's wrong because me being silently uncomfortable helps no one. It doesn't help them. It doesn't help me. And at least then like you're even saying they know now like, oh, I can't send this racist meme because Real's going to call me out on it. Yeah. So it's like the more people speak up in these environments to say that shit is fucked up. I don't think it's funny the more somebody will think to themselves, like, maybe I shouldn't share it. And I'm sure they will find other people to share it with. But at least you know that you're keeping your circle and your people safe. Because ultimately what I think of is never, like, not necessarily how I directly feel, but, like, if my kid's over here or their kid's over here, like, what does it do for children around you or people yeah. around you, right? That's the stuff I'm thinking about always. It's like if somebody's racist around me, and it's just me and them, I'm going to call them out on it anyway, but I'm especially going to do it because I also give them reasons for why it's wrong. I give them something to think about later. And they probably hate me for it, which is, like I said, why I don't have a lot of friends. <laughs> well, so then, you know, I think then it gets it gets complicated sometimes because I think the because I've talked to my friends about this, the ones that, you know, I've made it awkward for. And they're like, well, we're just trying to have fun. Right. We're just we're not oh. we're not trying to offend you. And also you are not this race. So, you know, when you when you know what they say to me is when you act like this, when you make it awkward for us, it feels like you are acting on behalf of somebody else and you're trying to do it to make yourself look better and feel better. Oh, you know God. what I mean? So then you have to kind of go through the entire thing. Right. So, you know, my main group of friends that I've had like these, I've had conversations with them for years about this now, right? And it's gotten to the point now where at the very least, they will not send outright racist shit anymore. And, you know, I, I know I, I'm not sure, you know, what the, what the audience is like for this, right? But I know within round communities, right? 
there is a lot of just accepted racism as a part of our day, as a part of our daily lives, as a part of our daily existence. Mm -hmm. It's what we came into this country. And there's a whole, you know, a whole, like a, a much longer conversation as to why that happens. Um, and it's really sad that, you know, it's, it's happened that way, but for a lot of those people, it's just, Hey, we're just having fun. Right. Mm. We're just having fun and you're making it awkward by making it awkward. And I'm like, oh, well, I, this is this is just a line that I don't like to cross. Right. Find better things to have fun with. Go fucking bowling. I don't know. Like there's way <laughs> more fun stuff. Like I just don't ever think that be like I don't ever find racist humor funny. Like and, and that's not to say that I didn't at some point when I was mm -hmm. younger, people used to make black people jokes, Asian people jokes, Jewish people jokes all the time. I remember yeah. hearing them in fucking middle school. And it's yeah. insane. And everybody used to trade laughs or whatever. And it was awful, right? But like, if I hear that shit now, I'm like, it's just not funny. There's funnier stuff. Like, yeah. there are funnier things than making jokes about the way someone looks, their background, their sexual orientation. And if that's the stuff that you find funny, or like women, ladies be shopping, like there's funnier shit. And if your jokes are coming at the cost of another group of people, then you're not that funny. Like, it's just, it's not funny. Sorry, like, I don't I'm know. I'm, I'm still giggling about ladies be shopping because that is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, like, so, I just, I don't know. I just. No, but I, then, I, I think, I think that that goes to like the, the other question, like what is actually good, right? So if, if my friends or, you know, if these guys aren't sharing like outright racist stuff anymore because they know it's going to be awkward, right? Yeah. They're just doing it on my behalf, Right. Are they actually learning anything? Because I don't think they are. They're just avoiding pain in the ass or heel. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think about that, um, uh, not to bring it back to sports, um, <laughs> but do you remember Do you remember the Donald Sterling story? Do you know who Donald Sterling is? Yes. It sounds familiar. So he was the owner of the Clippers. Right? Yes. He was the owner of the Clippers. There was a recorded uh, conversation with him and his mistress uh, where he said like outright racist shit. And, oh, that sounds know, very familiar. Yeah. Yeah. TMZ, and then, you know, it got published and then there was a whole question of, well, is it actually fair to take somebody's private conversation and judge them against it? Blah, 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 blah. So two things about Donald Sterling. Donald Sterling was an outright racist piece of shit mm -hmm. for like 40 years. Yeah. And, you know, not just the stuff that he said, the stuff that he did. He was like a landlord and he would price out the minorities um, he did. He just did a lot of terrible shit, right? Yeah. Then this tape come comes out, and it's a big deal. And the NBA is like reprimanding him, and they're like, "Well, we really can't force him to sell." Da 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 da. But the story became so big that they they found a way around it, basically, where they said, "Okay, you are banned from attending the games." And you have to pay like a $2 million fine. I don't remember how, how big the fine was or whatever. So it just made his life miserable, right? Mm -hmm. And then the NBA was like, you know what? Uh, they talked to his ex-wife who was in charge of the team and they convinced her to sell the team, right? Oh. Um, so that's how they did it. The net result of all this was, you know, at the time that the, that the report came out, the Clippers were probably worth a billion dollars. That's what an NBA franchise was worth. Yeah. He, when he sold the Clippers, because of how big the story was, he sold them for like $2.5 billion, right? And now they have a new owner. They have this guy named Steve yeah. Bomber. Yeah. So it's like, okay, great. We got the racist out of the NBA. But he, right? he, he also you became like a an extra $1.5 billion. Yeah. Right? And it's, it, we're actually going to be running into that again because the Suns owner is this guy named Robert Sarver. Again, a piece of shit, like people have known he's a piece of shit for the last 25 years, right? A report came out about all these abuses and how he's a racist and all this other stuff. So now his life is miserable. He doesn't get to be like the superstar owner of the Suns or whatever. So mm -hmm. he's looking for buyers. And what's going to end up happening is he's going to get a record price for the Suns because the story is big. The NBA <sighs> is really popular again. So now... A racist is going to get is probably going to make at least an extra half a billion to a billion dollars. Oh my god! Now the uh, now w the other thing that could have happened in the in both of these situations is that people say, "Hey, we're not supporting a racist, so we're not going to go to your games." 
and you bleed yeah. them out, right? Yeah. But I think who who is the onus on? You know, yeah, is that it's on the on people. The fans? Yeah, is that's bullshit. On, but, and the thing is, is like you'll find more than enough racists to support a racist. Oh yeah, reason. no one's gonna come out I mean? and support a racist more than racist. Like, exactly. It's it's actually it's a shame because I do think that like when when people go to boycott stuff, it's so hard to actually get people to boycott because yeah you're right one it's like it's not my fault that that person is racist right like i Mm -hmm. am a fan and i enjoy basketball and this is something that i love and it's a you know a team that i love etc etc why do i have to punish myself by not attending games that doesn't seem fair it's so hard and then it's like on top of that then you add on the racist fans that will now become new fans just because they're racist right like It it is uh it's a fucked up world. What tells what uh, this all this tells me is just that uh, capitalism is bad. <laughs> well, no, yeah. I think I think what what it tells me is that again we're in a transitionary period, um. So a lot of these things are going to happen. A lot of the stuff is going to be murky, probably for the rest of our lives, right? But what you hope is going to happen is you know a hundred years from now things are going to get better because you know like progress happens one way or the other, you know, right now, I think for the last five years, I have felt America being way more racist than I have in the, you know, in the 20 years before that. Right. But then I'm sure it's also because I just was, I just was, you know, I, I just wasn't aware of it. I'm more uh, aware thing of is it because now. we were all hearing, uh, anti-Semitic, uh, anti-black, anti-Asian jokes in middle school yeah. and we didn't know that that was fucking racism when it was. We were having uh, racism happen to us to our faces and we didn't know because that just we nobody told us that that was racist. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, we all used to do a Fabi accent at some point. I never had an accent. No, I'm just saying we all used to like make like a jokey Fabi accent. Oh god, the worst. The worst. Yeah. Thick accent jokes. I hate them. About myself, about anybody now. else, huh? With that first Russell Peters special, oh, we all yucked it up. Okay, but I feel like <laughs> it was okay because that was, was the okay. first time. Maybe I don't know. I Ray Sani always says it. She says that I'm not gonna get on stage. She's a comedian. She says I'm not gonna get on stage and make jokes about my own people for white laughs, mm-hmm. which is really important. Um, and a lot of Russell Peters and why he got so popular was because he did make jokes for white laughs. Even he did if it make made... jokes for white laughs, but then he got really popular with the brown people. Yes. You know what I mean? Because yeah. the brown people saw him succeeding in a white environment and they were like, hey, we can latch on him. That's right. The world is fucked up. The world is fucked up. We are all just <laughs> craving validation from the boot. <laughs> From those so yeah, so I think I would kiss Tom Brady on the back. <laughs> <laughs> hey, one more topic of um, our own people being the fucking worst. I wanted mm-hmm. to talk about the story that came out of Dearborn, Michigan. Yes. And it's super frustrating. So as we know, the country right now is fucking losing its mind, okay? Schools, even in New Jersey, have introduced... Um, teaching kids about non-binary people and trans people and, uh, you know, non-heterosexual marriages and relationships. And all the moms are losing their goddamn minds because they're idiots. So everyone's on an anti-gay, anti-trans frenzy. And Mm -hmm. in Dearborn, Michigan, which is a very, um, it's like the biggest Muslim community in America, right? Yeah, probably one of the oldest. It's the one that that seems that it's the most established, like American and Muslim. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes, correct. So currently in Dearborn, Michigan, there is um, a bunch of school districts that have decided to ban LGBTQ books. And... You know, we know around the world, like around the country, we know that there's a lot of uh, Christians, a lot of like right wing Christian groups that are doing this shit. They're obviously nuts. But in Dearborn, Michigan, it's especially like sad for me because a lot of the people that are out there protesting alongside with the Christians without with the right wingers are a bunch of Muslims. Um, 
And these are Muslims that, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, were fighting to have representations in schools for their own people, fighting for people to learn about Islam, fighting for people to learn, you know, the facts about Muslim people or about Arab people. These same people are now, 15 years later, protesting and trying to ban LGBTQ books. And it it, mm-hmm. it infuriates me because I feel like I've told you, maybe I've talked about it on the Patreon, but there's similar shit happening at like our mosque here. Mm-hmm. And I hate it so much. Um, over the summer, there was a bunch of moms in the mosque here that were uh, trying to have meetings to figure out how to save their children's innocence from public schools where their second graders are going to learn that there is such a thing as non-binary people and they feel like because of a 20-minute lesson in school, their kid will now become trans. Um, And I don't like – and it's so frustrating because it is one of those similar situations where you're like, I want my kids to be around people who look like them. I want them to learn a little bit more about their culture and all that stuff. And as a minority, it's so hard because sometimes I feel like – I feel like my I feel like I'm constantly in a fight between parent between myself, like between my Muslim identity and like my progressive identity of trying yeah. to make sure my kids understand both worlds. It's so hard, right? Because I feel like I figured it out for myself. Like I grew up being very uh very much um always riding the thin line of like not being Muslim enough for Muslim circles and not being not Muslim enough in non-Muslim circles, like not being Mm -hmm. liberal enough and not being conservative enough in whatever circles that I was in. But I'm like now 37 years old, I'm pretty confident in where I am, what I fit in, who I am. But when you're raising kids and especially kids being so binary as they are, like either you're all or nothing with little kids, like there's no nuance, right? It's so hard because I feel like I want my kids to have a Muslim identity. I want my kids to belong to a mosque. I want them to know what it means to like practice as a Muslim. But it's, yeah. I feel like I have to give that up because so many of those kinds of spaces are homophobic, transphobic, racist. And I don't know how to find a space that allows them to be, you know, accepting and inclusive of every single kind of person and also Muslim besides like my own house. Like my own house is the only place I feel like I could try to teach them both. And it's just very difficult uh, as a parent. Well, so I, you know, there's a lot. <laughs> Again, there's a, we, we would need um, like two hours to kind of get through all this stuff, right? But I think, first of all, I think the most important part is what you said at the end, which is regardless of where your kids are going to school um, and regardless of what they're learning from whatever institution, wherever they're learning it from, right? They're not going to pick up anything more valuable than what they learn at home. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, you know, these, um, these, these uh, Muslims in Dearborn, I guess these institutional Muslims, I guess I would call them. Yeah. I don't know what you mean by that. I don't mean like crazy Muslims. I mean like. uh, Institutionalized Muslims. Muslims. Yeah institution not institutionalized muslims but like you know muslims that look at islam as a, a political movement right yeah and that that kind of goes hand in hand with like kind of any mosque community that you belong to right i yeah. think it, that's where i get kind of confused sometimes like i have a great mosque over here but i only go there to play basketball <laughs> and for friday prayer that's yeah. it you know and sometimes i'll be uh, i'll be a part of like the ramadan stuff even the friday prayer you know sometimes the the, the sermon beforehand, the khutbah, I don't love because one of the ones that I went to, they were talking about the dangers of uh, therapy. I was what? Like, oh, this, this is not good. They're like, well, what? so you see, you see, uh, you see uh, the West is so ruined. And that's why you see all these people in therapy. I'm like, oh, what? my God. <laughs> so, yeah. So you have to deal with the craziness, right? I think um, the other part that is interesting is you're like, you know, 15 years ago, these people were. Muslims in this country were fighting for representation. And I think um, that's something that we didn't get a chance to kind of understand. Uh, You know, what happened is 9-11 happened. Mm -hmm. And Muslims that were unknown in America before. I mean, you know, some people knew what a Muslim was, but we weren't really known. Yeah. But Muslims in America became others. 
right? Yep. We became others. Um, and then the Republicans were like, fuck the others, right? So yep. we found a home under the like the progressive umbrella, right? Yeah. And our only connection, I mean, if we're being honest, like based on the stuff that you and I grew up with, based on the stuff that a lot of people that we love still believe um, when it comes to religion and homosexuality, when it comes to Islam and homosexuality, mm -hmm. um, you know, the only thing that brought us together with these progressives was the fact that we were others. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they were making space for us. What a lot of us didn't get a chance to do was to actually think through homosexuality, like actually have that conversation with ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. We just supported Democrats because Democrats were. Protected. It benefited us. It is, you know, it is so fucking selfish. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what we did. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think what's happening now is, is because uh, uh, gay rights and trans rights are in the conversation. Um, these Muslims that uh, benefited from the umbrella of protection that they got are like, oh, you know what? Now I can align myself. I can show my true colors. Right. And it sucks. It's it really terrible. Sucks. Yes. Yeah. The But the thing is, is like, you know, it's only been. I think 10 years since gay marriage got passed. Yeah. Right. And it's been 20 years since 9-11. So again, yeah. we are in this transition period. And what I have faith in is that eventually we will figure this all out. Like I have, you know, conversations with, with guys um, that have told me that I would rather that my son uh, get a girl, like knock up a girl than to have a gay son. Good and I'm like, how can you say that? They're like, yeah. well, you know, I just, you, you, one of them said to me, well, you know, I can't, like, the thought of it makes me sick. I'm like, why are you imagining your kid having sex? Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah, first like, of all, is, number one. Yeah, yeah maybe you should go to therapy. How about that? Exactly, right? Um, but I think what needs to happen is that, you know, people kind of just need to, they need to have an honest conversation with themselves. And I believe that if you do, I think if you have, like, a real conversation you will realize that, of course, of course, you should, like, you should not be, an, you know, anti-homosexuality. You should not have homophobia. You should understand trans rights and stuff like that, right? I think yeah. people right now are like, oh, you know what? I have an option. I have an option to be openly homophobic, so I'm going to take it. Yeah. Right? And that's what sucks. Um, but eventually, hopefully, you know, people will come around. I think I think it has to happen in your own time. Like, I remember exactly where I was when, you know, when I figured it out for myself, right? Yeah. I had, like, I had a moment when I was like, oh, no, this doesn't make sense to me. Like, yeah. my heterosexuality um, or, you know, homosexuality doesn't threaten my heterosexuality in any way. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. why do I even care, right? Um, and, you know, as far as, like, I don't know, like, when you think of homosexuality in Islam, you mm -hmm. always think about it as homosexuality versus Islam. Yes. When I'm sure there are so many gay Muslims and I really wish that they knew that there is a space for them. Like there's, I, I don't understand like how you can turn your back on anybody that believes in the same God as you. It doesn't make yeah. any sense to me. Yeah. Like, it's, and, and there are, like, I'm so grateful now because there are so many organizations that do mm -hmm. create spaces for um, queer Muslims. Yeah. And it just, it, but, you know, the, the shitty thing is, like, just because, the, just like there are Christians who are uh, still, like, very homophobic and very mm -hmm. transphobic, there's going to be Muslims that are very homophobic and very transphobic. And we are, unfortunately, going to have these spaces that are still going to be like oh yeah okay yeah you can come in here and pray but like just keep your gay stuff to yourself right like don't mm -hmm. tell anybody that you're gay there's gonna be a lot of like don't ask don't tell spaces for a while and like if if they're not blatantly just homophobic right yeah. and like the most i can do i feel like in these situations is number one like support spaces that are more inclusive but also just create spaces within my my surroundings like create have friendships or have social circles that are more inclusive that have all kinds of families and all kinds of people 
because that's the only way. Like that's the only way you can get it to work because even these people, right, that we know that are so fucking and uh, homophobic that say shit like that about their kids, their kids are eventually going to go to college. Like their kids are eventually going exactly. to become friends with kids like my kids who are like, dude, you're a homophobe. And they're going to be like, what's that? Like, eventually our kids are going to figure it out. Like even these psychotic moms that are trying to figure out how to protect their kids' innocence from being taught about non-binary people, like these idiots don't realize that their kids are in public schools. And even if they don't talk about it at school, their kids will become friends with non-binary people. Their kids will become friends with trans people. Their kids will become friends with gay people. Or their kid might be gay themselves. Like yeah. these things are inevitable. We cannot control those things. I mean, maybe, maybe like I have a different outlook on these things because of everything that we went through with Aiden. So I feel like I just don't stress out about those things. So I'm like, I'm just grateful that my kid is alive. So yeah. I don't know, but it's just, it's extremely disheartening and really sad to see people who were once othered now othering other people. And, yeah. you know, it's just the most I can do, I guess, is yell at them. Well, so, you know, my thing is uh, I'm optimistic about the situation um, because as um, as disheartening as it is. Right. I know that today's homophobe is better than yesterday's homophobe. You know mm. what I mean? Like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> That means that the homophobe today is going to tell me that homosexuality is wrong. The homophobe 20 years ago is going to want to kill a homosexual. You know Yeah, what I, mean? I mean, there are still homophobes so, that will want to kill gay people. Of course, yes. of course. Yes. But like, you know, the, the, the knee jerk reaction is going to be like, hey, we should kill all the homosexuals. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah, um, there's and, and, there's some more accountability right now happening. And, and, you know, and I think that kind of goes for everybody, like even myself, right? Like I know the journey that I went on to kind of get to the place where I'm at right now. Um, but I still know that there's a lot more stuff that I need to get better about when it comes to this stuff, right? Like, so even for example, right? Like, I don't know, like three minutes ago, I said I would kiss Tom Brady on the mouth, right? And we yeah. both giggled, right? Yeah. Um, now part of that joke for us is like the silliness of me kissing another man because you know me and like me kissing Tom Brady or whatever. No, there I think is... the silliness of it is that you would have the opportunity to kiss Tom Brady, not because oh, you you're think a man who kisses Tom Brady. Well, I think, I think, you know, for, especially for brown dudes, or at, at least the brown dudes that I like the good ones, right? Like if I say, I want to kiss your husband or whatever, we're going to giggle about it because for us, it's a little bit silly. Well, also because um, he's it, your brother-in-law. <laughs> exactly. That's the thing, right? So we can we can giggle about it because we're bros or whatever, and it would just be hilarious to watch us make out. But I think there is homophobia that's kind of baked into that, right? There's mm -hmm. a lot of homophobia that's baked into things that I'm not even aware of. Yeah, um, And that's down true. the line, we're, you know, down the line, what you hope is that you just get better about it. Yeah, you know I mean? it's so kind of like I, awesome. we said earlier that there's like misogyny baked into everything. There's homophobia yeah. baked in anything, everything. There's white supremacy baked into a lot of the shit that we exist in because that is the society that we live in. We live in a patriarchal, yes. patriarchal white supremacist society. And a lot of what we constantly have to do every single day is like try to work through that. That's true. And it sucks. And it's, you know, a lot of times it's frustrating and it's disheartening and, and all those things. But if there's like a place where these conversations can happen and if there's a place where I'm optimistic of us actually finding solutions to this stuff, it's here, right? Like, you, you know, you and I are talking about this here and we're talking about it openly um, and we have our opinions about it and stuff like that. We also know what happens in the country where we were born. And in the country of our origin, right? Like we yes. know what happens in Pakistan, and we know what happens in Saudi Arabia. So while it gets frustrating here from time to time, um, it's also frustrating because, like, being in America allows us to have conversations that we can have openly. Uh, a lot of other places, you don't have time to have these conversations. You don't have the time, and you don't have the freedom to have these conversations. So. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, one more topic, real quick, before we wrap this up. Um, and it's very controversial. 
Very, very controversial. Okay. The new, uh, the trailer for the Super Mario Brothers movie dropped, and yes. Chris Pratt is doing the voice of Mario, and yes, it just sounds like Chris Pratt. Yeah. And people are upset. Now, when you say people, are you upset? Because I it's know you complicated. Have, <laughs> yeah, because you have a big, your big Mario house. We're a massive Mario house. <laughs> if I could change my house to look like a mushroom, yeah. I would. Because <laughs> we are a massive Mario house. Okay, we've yeah. got about seventeen thousand Mario costumes. We have every single Mario game. We're all big, big mushroom heads over here. Okay. Yeah. Huge. But a couple of things. In addition to being a big Mario house, as you know, I am very anti Chris Pratt. Yes. Okay, number one. I am pro Chris Pratt. You're very pro Chris Pratt. Very complicated for you. Just went on a rant about how homophobia should be stomped out. Oh, we got- can, oh I need a whiteboard. <laughs> we need a whiteboard. We need an extra hour. Anyway, you love Chris Pratt. I do not. Okay, but here's the other complicated thing. Now, people are upset that Mario does not sound like he does in the video game, right? The voice is just regular Mario. But, like, should we be having a movie where Mario has a offensively comical Italian accent? (laughs) Like, I'm not sure where we're, like, as a society, like, are we saying, like, what are we mad at? Okay, is it the nostalgia that we were looking for? Was it the racism that we were looking for? <laughs> now, I mean, I, I don't yeah, know like the, the xenophobia, I, I guess, that we were looking for. Like, what was I it? Don't, I don't know the full history of uh, the <laughs> Mario games like you do. I obviously grew up playing Mario Brothers 1 and Mario Brothers 3. Super Mario Brothers 1 and 3 on Nintendo. Yes. Um, nobody played Super Mario Brothers 2. That game was shit. Um, <laughs> But the only thing that I've heard Mario say is that it's me, Mario. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> it's a me. <laughs> no, well, oof. We're going to have to censor that part. Um, but it's not like Mario like has conversations. It's usually just written, right? It says, Mar- thanks for saving me, Mario, but the real princess is in another castle. That's what it's comes got, up. It's, okay, well, it's gotten a little bit more advanced since then. You obviously haven't played Mario Odyssey, but go on. Yeah, but like... All he does is he just says, like, whoopee, and, like, it's a me, Mario, right? Like, it's not <laughs> no, like he's... Ever- they've also added a Mamma Mia. It's real bad. <laughs> <laughs> now, and then also, you think about it, Mario is actually Japanese, because Nintendo is Japanese. Correct. That's so right. So, are we, are we importing Japanese racism with the, with the it's a me, Mario? Yeah, also, it's... you know, Mario is a video game character. I don't know why he needs to have an <laughs> Italian accent. Another thing that they really fucked up. You remember, like, Mario... Do you ever see Mario in, like, say, even, like, Mario 64? Or, like, the newer mm-hmm. Mario? Like, you've seen my kids play Mario Odyssey and The stuff. 3D Marios. Yeah. yeah. Mario's got a caboose. <laughs> okay? This Mario? No but. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Uh, Mario, by profession, is a plumber. Correct. Right? As far as I can tell from the games that I've played myself and the games mm-hmm. that I saw your kids play, mm-hmm. his plumbing, uh, it only factors in when he goes down the pipes. It's not like he's ever fixing any pipes, right? <laughs> never. Is I've not seen that. Many- he's a- no, he's never fixed a pipe. <laughs> He's never fixed a pipe. I've never seen him with a wrench. Like, there's never... No. All he does is bops things. <laughs> he's either bopping a brick or he's jumping on a person. Um, Why are you sexualizing Mario by looking at his ass? How about that? <laughs> back to that later. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sexualizing him. I'm just saying... Mario has uh, had a caboose, and the, the, they erased it. They Not gave him aesthetic. a white man's voice and a white man's butt. <laughs> the Italians are white. <laughs> it's complicated. Um, uh, now, aesthetically, are you into Mario, short and stout, or are you into a Luigi? <laughs> well, slender. Luigi, Luigi is um, uh, he's a fearful, fearful, tender, sweet man. Oh. 
often overshadowed by his uh, short brother. Who's uh, playing the Luigi? I don't even know if Luigi's in the movie. What? Yeah, we should look up the cast. I'm sure there is. I know I'm very Black excited for Jack Black to be Bowser. Um, frankly, because oh. we've never ever heard Bowser's voice in the video games. He just roars. Charlie Day is playing Luigi. Oh, I love that. Because I love Charlie so, Day. Yeah, but he's also a white man. Why do you... <laughs> no. why? <laughs> it's not about his being a white man. I'm just saying... <laughs> the the voice people I'm not upset about it people were upset the only thing I'm upset about is Mario's butt but besides that the only <laughs> people were upset that Mario sounds like Chris Pratt but I was like what did you want him to sound like he should have never sounded like that in the first place yes <sighs> I, are you gonna watch it I'm gonna watch it oh dude I we just because it comes out a week after our nephew's birthday. Mm -hmm. I told our brother that they should rent out a movie theater and do that for his birthday party. Let's screw a private his birthday party. It, that sounds like it's like four days before somebody else's big birthday. It's three days before your birthday. Three days before I turn forty. <gasps> but that would be ridiculous if you had a Super Mario Brothers themed fortieth birthday party. I think that sounds amazing. Yeah, but you just said you've only played two of the games. I'm not going to let you appropriate that for my kids. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not uh, offended by anything that's going on in this movie. I'm looking forward to this movie. I think Chris Pratt is going to do a bang of job, and I think he's going to be hilarious. His voice work is usually very good. Yeah, he's yeah. very good. I, listen, he's Lego movies, right? listen, I enjoy Chris Pratt in all of the things that he's in. But he just he 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 he. I'm unsettled by him in real life. He makes me okay. uncomfortable. That's fair, and that's fine. That's fair. That's mm -hmm. my choice. Um, also important is that there is a, a Donkey Kong in it. Oh. And can you guess who does the voice of Donkey Kong? Guess it. Is it a male? Yep. Is it a white person? Yep. Is it a funny person? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I'm just going to keep going. Uh, there's, who's a white funny person? Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, uh, he, Everybody in comedy? Uh, yeah. He's in, it's Seth Rogen. Oh. Yeah. Seth I can't wait. Look, it's a looks like a bang up cast. You got yeah. Seth Rogen. You have Keegan Michael Key, Jack Black, Charlie Day. That's great. The That's lady from the chess movie plays Princess Peach. I haven't watched that chess movie. A chess, a chess is show? It a TV show? I have yeah. not watched the chess show because I don't know how to play chess. I don't know how to play chess. Either. And you know what? I'm going to be 40 in about four months. Never going to learn. <laughs> it's Never. too late. Half your life I'm is done. Totally fine. You're done. Well, yeah, exactly. Half of your life is gone. What am I gonna lose I'm going to say even real. I'm going to say sixty percent of your life is done. Hey, wait! <laughs> Cut off ten uh, years. Uh, like seventy. Seventy is a pretty good age to go. I'm clocking out at seventy. I told Fahad. What does clocking out mean? Don't keep me around longer than that. Take matters into your own hands. Yeah. Oh boy, this got dark. <laughs> <laughs> anyway i hope everybody enjoyed this episode it was a doozy um if you'd like us to talk about other topics feel free to let us know and i will be back on wednesday with arthi to talk about real houses of potomac and married to medicine fantastic yep to thank say you something? for yeah yeah go ahead you want to say should something? i have no, I don't. I really don't. I don't know if I should have. You want to have a sign off? Sign off. Yeah. A fancy <laughs> sign off? Why don't you uh, think about it? I will think about it and come back. Um, yeah. I think Whatever you do, do not say Mamma Mia like Mario at the end of this. <laughs> don't do three it. Three weeks ago, you asked me what my toxic trait was. And I'm yeah. thinking maybe that's something that I should. I don't know what it is yet. I heard the question and then I stopped thinking about it. And I just. Immediately. Yes. Oh, you, you were. Wait, what is your toxic trait? Trying to I think we decided on I was needy. I was needy, oh, yes. but not in a traditional needy sense. No, I make myself extremely available, so then people feel like they need me, and then I remove myself from the situation and create a vacuum. <laughs> <for people. laughs>
where people are like, oh, where is that guy? And then I'm like, oh, you need me again. And then I bring myself back. (laughs) Okay, great, great. Um, Okay, bye. (laughs) 